Okay, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Today is, oh, it's Friday something. It's Friday night. Look, it's funny. Like, <laughs> I know a lot of people are like, it's Friday night. I'm going out. I'm going club and doing whatever. This is what I do on my Friday nights. I, I, I love talking about sports. I love my job. I'm so happy to do it. So grateful for you guys listening and watching and however you're consuming the show. It means a lot to me. It really does. Um, today's episode, this is Ask Zach, episode seven. Uh, it's funded by Patreon. You're, if you're out there, you're like, what is Ask Zach? How does Ask Zach work? Uh, we're reading questions from Patreon supporters. How do you submit a question is the next question you might be asking. You go to patreon.com. Go to patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. You give a dollar a month. You can give more if you want. Please do it. Literally pays my rent. It's a huge help. Uh, but you can submit questions. And then once a week, I go through a list of all the questions. Um, I answer my favorite ones, and I do a full episode called Ask Zach. Um, if you donate, I do not guarantee to read your question or answer your question on the show. Um, I only guarantee, my only guarantee in this entire process is I do promise, I guarantee, I look at every single question and every single message with my eyeballs. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, getting a point, I'm getting to a point in my career, I can't even talk. How weird is that? I talk for a living and I like stutter and mumble like, <laughs> whatever, I, I'm happy with it, man. Um, I'm getting to the point in my career like where <sighs> I'm overwhelmed by a lot of messages and media. I think honestly, if you want to reach me, the best way to get a hold of me is through Patreon, to be totally honest, because I, I, I try to respond to people there. Uh, these are my most engaged fans. Um, I, I hate that it's behind a paywall. And look, I answer questions on Instagram and stuff too. I do do the best I can to engage with everybody, but I know that uh, Patreon is those are my people, and I love talking to them, and they're great. Um, and I, I don't, I, I just pick whatever questions I find interesting. It's a weird, it's a weird way to work, but it's just a smaller pool of people I can talk to, and that's great. So I, I don't know. Um, I wasn't intending to say that, but it is, it is really nice to have a pool of people I can talk to. Um, look, guys, first of all, I started the show today with. Oh my goodness. I normally don't do that with Ask Zach, uh, but I'm totally, it, it fits, man. I love it. That's my favorite. When, the days I don't, some days I start the show just going, good morning, good afternoon. And it feels very like, I don't know. It's not the same. It doesn't have the same vibe. Uh, I'm drinking my favorite drink today. I can't tell you what it is yet, but we are close to getting him to sponsor the show. I want to start with a question today from Clutch God. Clutch God writes in, he says, hey, Zach. I'm writing this right after the news of Eli Manning's retirement came out. What was your favorite part about his career? I think his attitude towards the game and his leadership are vastly underrated, but I'd like to know what you think of him. So uh, here's where my mind goes immediately when I hear that. Um, Eli Manning, look, has done a lot of stuff in his career. He's the seventh all-time uh, leader in passing yards. He's got uh, 57,023 passing yards. He's also seventh all-time in passing touchdowns and again, seventh all-time in uh, passes completed. He's won two Super Bowls. He was a two-time Super Bowl MVP, which is just it's ridiculous and crazy. Um, you know, he beat the Patriots twice, which is, like, special. In fact, he beat the Patriots that one year when the Patriots went 18-0 and leading up to the Super Bowl. They had an undefeated regular season, made it all the way to the Super Bowl. The Patriots were 18-0, and and Eli Manning beat them. And I'll never forget the helmet catch, and he escaped the sack. And there are so many cool moments throughout Eli Manning's career. In fact, Eli Manning, you know, Peyton Matt, excuse me, what am I saying? Tom Brady tweeted about Eli Manning's career, and he said this. He said, congratulations on your retirement and a great career, Eli. Not going to lie, though. I wish you hadn't won any Super Bowls. I think that's awesome. Uh, I, I really, it may, it's, it's an explanation of Eli's career, right? He's got these monumental victories over an incredible football team, the Patriots, um, and had a career of incredible moments. But to me, the two moments that stand out the most from Eli Manning's career are actually the way it started and the way his career ended. So I want to start with that. The way his career ended was so classy. Um, you know, he's the, he was the quarterback, the backup quarterback for most of the year last year in New York with the Giants. He got benched for rookie quarterback Daniel Jones. And that's a tough situation. Getting benched, losing your job, that sucks, man, especially to a rookie player. And he handled it so graciously. I was really impressed with the Eli Manning. Just being a total pro, being a grown-up, he was very gracious. He seemed to help uh, Daniel Jones a lot on the sidelines and in person. There's that great video of them playing I like drinking together at a bar. And it's like, <laughs> it's cool, man. Like Eli seems like a good dude who treated Daniel Jones well. I love that. It was awesome. But my personal favorite moment of Eli's entire NFL career actually has nothing to do with him playing. My favorite moment of Eli's career was when he refused to go to the Chargers. If you remember that, uh, it's not only my favorite moment of Eli Manning's career. It's one of my favorite sports moments 
literally of all time. I, I love, love, love the story I'm about to tell. Before the 2004 NFL draft, Eli Manning told the Chargers, if you draft me, I will not play for you. He said, I'm not going to do it. And it's ballsy. It's pretty amazing. I, I want to explain. The, I'm going to tell you the whole reason why I love it. But first, I got to say, like, the Chargers didn't listen to Eli. <laughs> the Chargers didn't believe him. They thought he was bluffing. And Eli's like, no, I am not going to give in. I'm not going to play for you. And in the end, uh, ultimately, Eli Manning was traded to the New York Giants. You know, the Giants got Eli Manning and the Chargers got Phillip Rivers. And I, I mean, I, I love this part of, you know, there's only two examples in NFL history where a quarterback has taken a stand and said, I'm not going to play for this team. John Elway did it when he was a rookie and uh, Eli Manning's done it. And I wish it happened more. I love when people do this. Quarterbacks in the NFL draft don't seem to understand that they have so much leverage and so much power. Now, I want to explain why this matters in a, it, it's not really an analogy. It's kind of a story that relates, it, to relate, relates to my career. And um, I, I think it will help people understand why I find this moment so cool. Um, when I got to 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, my, my life kind of changed. My career changed a lot. And I started getting offers from networks. I get offers from networks constantly. And they're always negotiating. I actually, I let my dad take care of it. Thank God. I can just make stuff. My dad does a lot of that stuff. I'm really grateful for that. Um, but they come to you and say, we want you to do this and this and this and this and, you know, this. And you got to change this thing and change this thing. And, you know, you got to get a haircut. You got to wear different shirts. You got to And I'm like, look, man, I have my show and it's the way I make it. And I'm happy with the way I make it. I mean, like, maybe I'll get a better set someday. I acknowledge the set could be better. Uh, it'd be nice to have some video, like there are little things a network could bring that would be good, but I'm not going to make the major changes they want me to make. I am myself and I make the product I like. And I think part of why strong opinion sports succeeds is because it's not network television. I, I'm very intentional and try to be different and try to be more authentic and have a layer of honesty that I think some other sports shows, at least the ones I grew up with, don't have. And, um, you know, to compromise what I think makes the show special seems like a bad idea to me. I was like, I'm not going to listen to that. And then I realized in all these negotiations with networks, I was like, wait a minute, I have all the power. <laughs> they want to work with me. I, they need, I, I don't need them. I have revenue. I'm good. Like I, I have a place. I'm very happy. I don't need their help. And so when I realized that, I took a step back and was like, no, I am not compromising. I'm not doing, I'm doing it my way. And if you want to be work with me, you can, but I have all the power here. And you know, because I want the show to be accessible to everybody. I want people to be able to listen to it for free. It means a lot to me to have that. I'm not going to put it behind a paywall. There's a lot of things I don't want to change and I will not budge on. And so I, you know, I have a vision for strong opinion sports. I'm not going to change that. And I actually did sign with a network recently, but it hasn't changed anything. The show is exactly what it is. You don't even, hopefully you don't even notice the change. Like it really, nothing changed. And that's great. I, I really hope that. Um, but I, you know, when I see quarterbacks in the NFL draft that don't realize the power they have, it drives me nuts. I mean, you see Russell Wilson or Aaron Rodgers sign 150, 250, like gigantic contracts for millions and millions of dollars. And they understand, like Russell Wilson understands his value. Why can't a rookie quarterback who's going to be the face of a franchise understand, hey, you need me more than I need you. You failing NFL franchise need a quarterback. I'm your answer, but I have all the power here. So it fires me up when people don't understand that. Eli Manning didn't want to go to the Chargers. He recognized, and look, he was, uh, a lot of people look back on Eli Manning and feel like his dad was this overpowering force. No, Eli Manning was lucky to have his dad. The way it seems to me is, you know, John Elway rejected the Colts a long time ago when the Colts were way more messed up. John Elway didn't want to go to the Colts. He had his dad helping him. And Eli Manning didn't go, want to go to the Chargers. In fact, he didn't go to the Chargers because he had his dad, Archie Manning, help him. But in the, both of those scenarios, they had a person who was incredibly informed on the NFL, giving them advice saying, hey, uh, the ownership group or the management group of this team is one you don't want to work with. And it, I, you know, I just, it's interesting to me that it worked. Eli Manning said, I'm not going, and it paid off. And Eli Manning won multiple Super Bowls. He won, uh, he's got a lot of records. He did a lot, but my favorite moment all time from Eli Manning's career is actually the way it began with him saying, hey, I have the leverage. I have the power. You need me more than I need you. I'm not going to work with you. I refuse. Him taking a stand is my favorite moment in Eli Manning's career, and it's one of my favorite moments in sports of all time. I love it so much.
This is cool to me, man. Eli Manning said, I don't want to play for the Chargers, their ownership group, their management group. I'm good. If Eli Manning went to New York, Philip Rivers went to the Chargers, and it's interesting. They're both good quarterbacks. A lot of people say that Philip Rivers is actually a better quarterback than Eli Manning. But which quarterback between the two won multiple Super Bowls? Mm, you think that Eli Manning being with the New York Giants, a better run organization, might have played a part in that? Maybe playing for a better franchise made his career better, made his life better? I think so. Working for good people is really important. Not being the whole, really, you have power. You don't need to work for people you don't want to work for. And that's, that's a lesson I learned in my professional career in the last two months. And it's so prevalent and so many people don't seem to understand that. Uh, look, Eli Manning was going to be a franchise quarterback for somebody. Him not wanting to work for the Chargers was cool to me. I love that. Yeah, you know, I don't want a corporate overlord for strong opinion sports. I don't have one. Thank God I have a network I work with, but I do my own thing. They're, they're lucky to work with me. I really believe that. And so I feel the same about Eli Manning. I hope I don't sound too egotistical. I'm, I'm really not. I'm very lucky to do what I do. And, um, but that moment with Eli Manning's career is the one that stands out to me. And I go, Duh! that's the best moment. Eli Manning's career, in my opinion, the one that'll leave the lasting impression on me is I will always look to Eli Manning as that one guy who was smart enough to recognize his value as a person and as a quarterback, and he didn't go play for a bad group of people and a bad management group. You have power. Take advantage of it. That's what I would say to a lot of young quarterbacks going into the NFL. Don't go play for a bad franchise. Don't go play for a franchise with bad ownership, a bad general manager, or maybe no general manager at all. Eli Manning is, that's one of my favorite sports moments of all time. And I will always respect Eli Manning for having the balls to say, I'm not going to go play for Dean Spanos and the Chargers. May he forever rest in peace. Okay. uh, Randy writes in, Randy says, is Eli Manning a hall of famer? Why or why not? A lot of people want to have this discussion. Is Eli Manning a Hall of Fame quarterback? I've gotten this question. I, I do not exaggerate thousands of times. It's oh, Instagram messages. It's like I, I read them too much. It, it like is so overwhelming, actually, how many I get. And it's uh, I want to be careful here because every time I say something, people misinterpret my, my opinion on an athlete and think it's personal or think I hate somebody. I love Eli Manning. He gave me one of my favorite sports moments of all time. He's got so many good sports moments. But I do not believe Eli Manning is a Hall of Famer. It's for a very simple reason. The fact that you have to ask says it all. The fact that you have to be like, hey, uh, I'm not sure. Is Eli Manning a Hall of Famer? That pause, that hesitation, that's the problem. Everybody in the sports world is having this gigantic debate. Is he? Is he not? Is he a hall? Some people are very passionate. He is a Hall of Famer, and some people are very passionate. He is not. And my guess is most people in the sports world throw out all these stats. He's number seven in like three categories, like passing yards, passing touchdowns, and completions. Like he is statistically like, I don't know, you can have that argument if you want, but you're wasting your time. You shouldn't have to convince somebody that another person is a Hall of Famer. If you have to try to convince somebody or sell it, it's wrong. It should be obvious if someone is a Hall of Famer. That's not a, you shouldn't have to force it. That shouldn't be a long conversation. I'm going to make a silly analogy, but it's true. When I go buy jeans, if I'm trying on jeans and I'm not sure, I don't buy them because it's not clear. It's not obvious. It's the same way with Hall of Fame. Indecision is no. If you're like, "Mm," like, here's the thing. If you're dating somebody and you're not sure if you like them, end it. Walk away, go find someone you know you really like. I'm going to list some names. Jerry Rice, Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Ray Lewis, and Larry Fitzgerald. When you hear those names, you think Hall of Fame. Michael Irving, Hall of Fame. There's no debate whether or not those names are Hall of Famers. It's just obvious. It's very clear. When I said Tom Brady didn't go, "Mm," nobody hesitated. Jerry Rice, there's no hesitation. Clear, obvious. Ray Lewis, clear, obvious Hall of Famer. There's no hesitation. If you ask someone if they're a Hall of Famer and they pause and go, mm, it's, it's a no, it's over. It really is that simple. It's that simple. Eli Manning, I love him. Had a great career, ton of respect. Really, again, Eli Manning, the way he started his career, I did a whole topic about it, about Eli Manning's retirement and why I love him and his career. Eli Manning's not a Hall of Famer. The fact that it's this super polarizing debate and people don't agree yes or no, that's the reason why right there. It's exactly why. 
the fact that it's a conversation, the fact that nobody's sure, that's why Eli Manning's not a Hall of Famer. It should be obvious. If it's not obvious you're a Hall of Famer, you don't make the cut. You can make an argument if you want. People can always make an argument for anything. You can make an argument that, I don't know, that cardboard's better toilet paper than regular toilet paper. I mean, you, <laughs> I, I'm not saying you should, but you could make an argument. You can make an argument for a lot of things. That doesn't make it true. And so Eli Manning in my book, and what a weird analogy that was cardboard, a t- a terrible image. I'm sorry if you're in your car listening. Um, but that to me is why Eli Manning is not a Hall of Famer. If he was, it'd be clear and it'd be obvious and you wouldn't have to ask in the first place. All right, uh, Patrick writes in. Patrick says, hi, Zach, another question for you. I just watched the highlights of the Hawaii Bowl and Hawaii quarterback Cole McDonald had a great day with almost 500 yards passing, four touchdowns, and I have seen good performances from, from, good performances from him in the past as well. And I wonder, what do you think of him as an NFL prospect? Greetings, Patrick. Um, I'm going to tell you what I see when I watch Cole McDonald. This is not officially a film analysis. If I can get all his film organized, I watched uh, five games. If I can get more film on him, we'll do a full film analysis. Uh, right now, I'm not sure. It depends on if Hawaii gets back to me. and I, you know, We got a lot. We'll see. But um, there's one thing I want to say. I love the way that Cole McDonald is capable and willing to steal yards underneath. It's a really good trait in a quarterback when he's like, hey, the guy's open at five yards. I'm just going to take five yards every single time. He does that, and that's really good. That's something an NFL quarterback needs to have, and I love that. Uh, and more importantly, he's comfortable doing it, right? He has operated a system for a long time, throwing the ball a lot, many times a game, and he's comfortable stealing yards. That's a huge deal. But I have numerous concerns about Cole McDonald. We'll get into that. Uh, I want to say I, a lot of people like Cole McDonald because of his numbers. He has good statistics. I, I'm not into fantasy football crap. I hate that. Uh, I think a lot of people think that stats equate to being successful as a, a quarterback or as a as a player. Uh, having good stats in college does not mean you're going to be good in the NFL. There are endless, endless examples of this. Colt McCoy, Colt Brennan, another Hawaii quarterback. Um, I mean, look at the list of all-time leaders in passing in college. Not every single one of those was a, was a successful quarterback in the NFL. Sean Mannion has incredible stats in the Pac-12. Where's his success in the NFL? It doesn't exist because he's not that actually that great. Um, you know, straight up, I don't like Cole McDonald's mechanics. Uh, I also hate his deep ball. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, he has an awkward and slow release. It's kind of a, a whip. It's a long delivery. He doesn't separate very well. You want to separate and then throw, and he kind of has a long, over-the-top kind of weird release. It doesn't work. And he doesn't have a cannon. I will say Cole McDonald's arm strength is good enough to succeed in the NFL. And with some mechanical tweaks, if he learned how to use his core and how to use his legs, he could have even more arm strength. I mean, there are some throws that Cole McDonald misses downfield because he's not using his legs or he's not using his core. So with some little tweaks to his mechanics, if he works with a guy guy like Jordan Palmer or somebody and they can really help him, Cole McDonald could make a lot of strides as a thrower of the football. But he throws like a whip. That long delivery, he like pulls it back and then pulls the ball all the way over forward. Uh, It causes him to have a slow release and... What that means and the impact that has is that from the time he decides to throw and starts pulling the ball backwards to the ball actually coming out of his hand, it takes a long time. That process is too slow, and it allows defenders time to react. They see the ball go backwards. They go, ooh, I'm going to break, and they break on the ball. By the time the ball gets there, they can knock it away. It's very easy to defend, and a lot of the passes that Cole McDonald completed in college will not be completed in the NFL right now because he's going to play against better, more talented, and faster guys who can recognize when a throw is coming quicker, and they're just, they just literally move quicker. So Cole McDonald will not have the same success in the NFL he had in college. Um, and a lot of his statistical success, he has great numbers, but a lot of that is because of the system he ran. He, he threw the ball a lot. Uh, he was throwing the ball constantly. He played for Nick Rolovich, who's a run-and-shoot technically offense. Defi- there, there's a lot of ways to define that. It seems like everybody has a def- different definition of run-and-shoot. It just means he throws the ball a ton, and that's part of why his numbers are so good. I don't love his deep ball either. Um, Cole McDonald can throw the ball a long way. That's not what I'm talking about. People really don't understand arm strength and deep ball. They just, they're totally uninformed on how the quarterback position works at all. Um, at Hawaii, Cole McDonald's deep ball location was bad. It sucked. Uh, what that means is that he would often throw vertically to a spot downfield, 40 yards outside the numbers. That's kind of a lot. He just kind of aims to a general area rather than throwing to a man. He couldn't beat 
great man coverage into a really small window vertically because he's just putting the ball up. And a lot of times that leads to jump balls or often, in his case, overthrows. I mean, there's a throw against BYU where he badly misses a, to a guy who's wide open downfield, open by like four yards, misses the throw because he just he doesn't throw precisely to a small location downfield. He throws to an area, not a man. Um, he also forces the ball into coverage. If you go watch the BYU game, that is the bowl game, the SoFi Hawaii Bowl. His stats are great. Uh, you know, Cole McDonald has great statistics from that game. But if you watch the film, you'll go, hey, uh, highlights are one thing. Watch every throw. Because every throw, if you watch, I encourage you, like, Cole, you know, even Patrick wrote in and said, I watched the highlights. You can't just watch a quarterback's highlights and assume he's good. No offense to you, Patrick. I'm not saying you did that. I mean, it just got your mind rolling and you were curious. But if you go watch every throw Patrick, uh, Cole McDonald made against Hawaii, you'll see that. He regularly threw the ball into coverage. There were moments where BYU dropped interceptions they should have caught, and he's forcing the ball into like triple coverage. You're like, what are you doing, dude? What, what's happening here? There was a moment where BYU started taking away the seams, which is a throw over the middle, and he kept trying to throw it there. It's like, dude, stop. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting your team. You're just getting lucky they're not intercepted. So, um, and, and then he had that guy deep. He just missed. It's like, man, you can't do that either. Um, now, He had some good moments. I, I'm personally not impressed with Cole McDonald. Um, he's been on my radar for a long time, and he just never developed the NFL traits I wanted him to. He had a great sophomore year, and I was like, ooh, ooh, Cole McDonald, maybe he'll get there. And he, he did get better as a player, but the, the NFL traits he needed never have developed. And there is a chance he can succeed. Uh, if Cole McDonald can sit for a while and learn and improve and tweak his mechanics and get better at reading a defense and doing a lot of little stuff, great. Um, but you could say that about literally, I mean, <laughs> 90% of quarterback prospects, there's a chance they could succeed, right? There's, it's very rare you see a quarterback that is just awful and has no hope. Um, currently, Colton McDonald is not ready to succeed in the NFL. I do want to add this too. By the way, it's kind of weird. The ball comes out of his hand awkwardly sometimes. He's got long, like, like a weird me- like release and weird mechanics. But sometimes the ball literally just comes out ugly. And when a guy struggles to throw a spiral, or he throws an indirect spiral, which means that you're like spinning the ball, but you're not actually throwing the ball. It, there's a difference here. So like, how do I explain this? I could throw the ball at you, but the spiral should be directed like where at your small location. Like it, the spiral should feel like it's coming directly into your soul. Like he like, ooh, that spiral's coming right at me. The ball like spiraling, but it's kind of sideways and it's coming towards you. That's like I just spinning the ball. And he does that sometimes. And then the ball comes out wobbly and weird. Like there are moments where I th- watch Cole McDonald throw the ball and I go, how did that happen? Like, it's, it's in the right area, great, but it's like an ugly, awful duck, and how did that happen? This is a weird minor thing that I don't know how to explain very well, but it is a real factor that makes you go like, can he throw in cold weather? Can he throw in a lot of wind? Is he? I don't know. It's, a very, it's like an indirect spiral. It's very awkward. I don't know how to explain this because it's you guys don't play quarterback, and I know that it's, it's hard to understand, but you do see that from time to time with Cole McDonald. So look, um... If a team takes him, there is a chance he makes it, right? But a lot, the problem is with Cole McDonald. Like, I would love to see Cole McDonald with the Patriots. I think he fits in their system. They love to steal yards underneath. He could fit really well in that system. But they have Jarrett Stidham, so he'd have to be the third quarterback on the roster. And I think that where Cole McDonald is going to struggle, like, he, he could be a sixth, seventh, or a draft, round draft pick, or maybe a free agent added to a team. But most NFL teams don't carry a third quarterback. And when you do carry a third quarterback, it's because either... You know, you're like the, the 49ers just love their quarterbacks. They're not going to get rid of any of them. Or um, you, you keep a quarterback because their physical upside is so good that you just want to keep them around and train them. Like uh, somebody's going to draft Jordan Love. And Jordan Love might not be ready to even be a backup this year. Like if, uh, if the Saints drafted Jordan Love, right, they'd have Teddy, they'd have, in theory, this is a, a hypothetical, but in, uh, hypothetically you'd have Drew Brees, a guy who's ready to play in case Drew Brees gets hurt. And then you're keeping Jordan Love on the sideline, just learning all year, getting him ready for the next year when Drew Brees potentially retires. But Jordan Love, you don't want to throw in a game. And so, but you keep him around because he's so physically gifted. The upside is there. I don't see that physical upside from Cole McDonald. He doesn't have incredible arm strength. He's not a great, incredible runner. He's not super accurate. There's nothing that jumps off the page from Cole McDonald. So he could be on a roster, but he's not going to... I don't think anybody would keep him either as a third overall, like a third string quarterback because his upside isn't so incredible you might keep him and waste a roster spot when you could have an, a better guy who could contribute on special teams or uh, maybe play in a game. So I don't think Cole McDonald makes an NFL roster. I, I might be wrong. We'll see. And we'll see what kind of development he takes with better coaching You know, through this NFL draft process. Maybe he works with Jordan Palmer and 
he, he better he uses his core better, fixes his mechanics, who knows? But currently, today, today is January, uh, January twenty fourth, uh, twenty eight twenty. I almost said twenty eighteen. It's definitely not twenty eighteen. Currently, Cole McDonald is not ready for the NFL, and uh, that, that's unfortunate. I, I'm rooting for him. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but what I see on film is that Cole McDonald has a lot of little things he needs to work on. I just laid them all out for you. Uh, but that's how I feel about Cole McDonald, the quarterback out of Hawaii. I love him, though. I follow him on Instagram. He's a really interesting life. And uh, I'm rooting for him as a quarterback and as a person. Okay, with your eyeballs, writes in. He says, hey, Zach, you're in the huddle, and a play comes in. What type of play got you hyped? And what play made you go, oh, no, not this play? Um... There's not many too. There's not very many plays that got me too high or too low. I mean, I I don't know. I I, I loved being in the huddle. Just period. I, I really my favorite moments in college, especially, were like in the huddle and you, you make eye contact with guys. You call the play, and it's so much. You, Wyatt, can we go on two? And you ask Wyatt, and he, he nods his head. We can go on two. We got this. And the offensive line agrees. And those moments are like the best. Like right, being in the huddle is great. Um, the plays that made me hesitate or made me kind of go. Ooh, that's a bad idea. It was when a coach would call a play that you're not prepared for. And I was always prepared. I worked really hard to understand the playbook. But you'd have a guy like, you you have a new receiver in this week or a new receiver in for this play, and he's got to go in motion, and he doesn't even understand the signal for the motion. Or uh, you have a guy who is learning the playbook, and that would always be frustrating to have a more complicated play, and you know that you're set up to fail uh, with a guy who, like a tight end's going to run the wrong route, and you're like, ah, crap. And especially when you're in the middle of like a quarterback battle, and every play matters, and you can't really have a wasted rep where guys run the wrong route, and they do run the wrong route, and you're like, man, all I can do is try to run or make something happen, but I'm really not showcasing my ability to make a decision because they all ran the wrong route, and that's, that's really frustrating when things like that happen. Um, here's what I can say I really hate it. This is where I'll go with this, actually. Um, I hate it. I, I really, really hated playing scout team quarterback, especially in college. You know, here's how it works. You're up against the starting defense. And as a scout team quarterback, you're running the other team's plays. What that means is whatever team you're playing that week, let's say I'm going to make up a team. Let's say you're playing uh, Greensdale College this week, right? That means you're running, you, you go to your school, but you're going to run their Greensdale offense all week. And you're running plays you're not familiar with, you're not prepared for. And here's how it works. Like an assistant coach runs up and you get in the huddle and he, the, the assistant coach holds up a little card and you have like three seconds to digest all the plays, the the protection, what you're doing. Like, are you doing a fake handoff? Or are you doing are you doing play action? And then what routes are people running? It literally like you have to digest all of this in three seconds. And they're plays you've never run in your life. You don't own a name for them. You don't really know the read progression very well. You're getting thrown to the wolves basically. And they're like, do your best, kid. And it's fine for a receiver because a receiver can go out there and be like, okay, uh, I'm this guy. I have one job. I got to run a slant, or I got to run a vertical, or whatever. But for a quarterback, it's nearly impossible because you know, they're, they're using route combinations you've never seen before. There's different timing. There's different formations. You literally haven't, you don't know the read progression half the time. You're just making it up on the fly. Like, I think it might be better if I go to this guy first, then this guy, then this guy, and then this area and high-low it. You're just making it up on the fly. You're getting thrown to the wolves. And it's so, so frustrating because there's no way for you to study or prepare. And that's who I was as a quarterback. I just really worked hard to prepare. And it was so infuriating to me in college, especially my last place. That offensive coordinator and I just, we, we didn't get along. And he would say, we're giving you scout team reps because we want you to have a chance to improve as a quarterback. And it's a total lie. It's not true. Uh, this is when, when, when coaches lie to quarterbacks is when they say, use your scout team reps to get better. And a lot of coaches throughout the league or throughout, you know, throughout high school football especially are getting mad at me right now. They're like, Zach, how can you say that? Because it's, it's, it's a manipulation tactic. Literally, like the way what they do is say, hey, quarterback, you're going to run the scout team offense and it's going to help you get better. And as a quarterback, you can't really argue. You got to say, yes, coach, and do the best you can. And that's, if you're a kid out there, do the best you can. But don't listen to that crap when they tell you that you're going to use it to get better because you're not running your playbook. You're not running plays you've ever been familiar with. You're running an, another team's offense. You get three seconds to digest the play. That's not a good, efficient way to learn a playbook. And you're literally running routes and route combinations you don't even know the read progression to. You're getting thrown to the wolves. And it's an incredibly frustrating experience as a quarterback. Can that really be put in a position to succeed? Again, it's fine for a receiver. He's just, he's just only worried about one route. But you're like, I have to dissect the defense and do all this stuff, and I don't even know where the guy's going to be for sure because I've never seen the play other than that one time you held up a card very briefly. Like, it's a pain, man. You can't prepare for it at all. 
Now, what you can do if you're a quarterback in this situation, uh, you hope they're playing man coverage because then you can pick a good matchup and work on throwing the ball against man coverage, maybe work on verticals, throw a back shoulder ball. Uh, but if they're playing zone defense or they're running a really complicated scheme, you have no idea with, and you're like, I, how do I succeed here? It's, it's a pain, and it's honestly, again, I go back to this, it's when coaches lie to quarterbacks. They say, use your scout team reps, and it's like, dude, this isn't going to help me run my defense at all or run my, run my own offense at all. Uh, scout team, this is huge, especially if you're like a, if you're a college football player out there, like a, especially at a smaller college, scout team is so, so important, right? It really does matter. Uh, especially, you know, it's important for the defense though. Scout team, the scout team offense makes the defense better. That's why they're there. That's what they do. You know, my, the reason why my high school football team was so successful is because our scout team was incredible. We had sophomores that worked their butts off. They were there. They gave great effort. They made the defense better. And in the process, getting their butts kicked by the defense, they got a little bit better, especially receivers. A receiver on the scout team has a great opportunity to get better because you're running routes against a live defense. It might be the only time all practice you get an opportunity to run routes against the scout team defense. And you can work on catching the ball in traffic. You can work on beating your man. There's a lot of stuff you can do. But as a quarterback, it's a little bit different. As a quarterback, you're trying to operate everything and trying to read the defense and trying to understand the playbook. And when you don't have a familiarity with the plays you're running, it's a death sentence. You can't prepare. You're, you're second-guessing your decisions because you're not sure if the receiver is going to be where he's supposed to be. You don't know. You're not familiar with the playbook. And that, that's an infuriating moment for any quarterback running an offense. A scout team quarterback... <sighs> It's the most frustrating time of my life. I hated it so much. And then they lie to you. They say, you're going to get better as a quarterback. Not really. I'm going to get better maybe at extending a play because the play breaks down or my offensive line is terrible and I got to run. Or you get better at like physically throwing a deep ball because you're just picking a matchup on a, a vertical man-to-man coverage. But you're not going to get better at running your offense, running another team's offense with plays you're not familiar with. So um, I hate it, man. No preparation. Timing's all screwed up. Those are the plays I hated as a quarterback. When I mean, coaches would lie to me and say that, the scout team, running a scout team offense is making you better. It's just false. It's just not true. I have a lot of friends that are high school football coaches out there. Uh, I, I've gotten job offers to be a high school football coach. And I can tell you, man, I would never lie to a quarterback. I'd say, hey, look, do the best you can. You're here to help the defense. But you don't know these plays. You don't know the progression. I went on a long rant there. I didn't mean to necessarily. Um, but that is, those are the plays I hated running as a quarterback were the plays I wasn't prepared for when I felt like I was being thrown to the Wolves. Okay, um, Caleb writes in. Caleb says, Hello, Zach. I am very excited for the NFL this year and this new decade in the 2020s. What themes do you think will play out in this era, 2020 to 2019, uh, 2029 of football? Uh, first of all, Caleb, I love you. You're a big supporter of mine. You're awesome. And, and I love your question, but I'm going to expand your question uh, beyond and broaden the conversation beyond just football. Because when I read this question, my mind actually went immediately to the NBA, and the MLB, Major League Baseball. You know, first of all, I, I can't wait to see who will be the best player in the world in basketball in 10 years. I don't know. Uh, it feels to me like this next decade in NBA is going to belong to Giannis, uh, the Greek freak out of Milwaukee. He's amazing. He's one of my favorite players, the way he's transformed his body, the way he's developed as a player, and he's, he's the, probably, like, he's the best in the world, and he's still getting better. It's like, this is awesome. I love it. Um... And I also wonder, like, will Zion pan out? Is Zion Williamson with the New Orleans Pelicans, is he going to work? Like, is he is he going to be Greg Oden and get hurt and flame out? Or is he going to become a really a great star with a lot of longevity? I don't know. But Zion is so fascinating to me. Like, in 10 years, will Zion still be in the NBA? I don't know. I hope so, because it'd be fun if he was. Like, that'd be a great league with Zion for 10 years. Will the Pelicans ever get better? I mean, that's, I generally wonder, because the Pelicans are this young team with young stars everywhere. Are they going to win? Are they going to make the playoffs someday? Are they going to make a run? I don't know, but I'd love to see that happen. Um, we get to watch Luka Doncic in the next 10 years, which is, like, unbelievable. Will Trey Young ever change the Atlanta Hawks? Uh, ja Morant's awesome. We get to watch the Denver Nuggets develop and get better. Um, and then I really, when I think about baseball, this is brutal. Uh, it's going to make baseball people mad, but I genuinely wonder, like, Will baseball be around in 10 years? Is baseball still going to be a thing? I'm sure it will to some degree. But is Major League Baseball going to be on television in 10 years? I, I genuinely wonder that. Uh, I hate the Pro Bowl. I think the Pro Bowl is an insult to football. 
And I'm not going to watch the Pro Bowl. I don't give it any oxygen. I don't talk about it. I, it's like my silent protest. I hate the Pro Bowl. I want it to be gone. It's not good for anybody. It's just awful. It's a waste of time. Will the Pro Bowl be around? I don't know. But I, when I think about the Pro Bowl, it's weird to me that the Pro Bowl is an awful product that nobody likes and not very many people will watch. But it still gets higher ratings on television than some of the Major League Baseball playoff games, which is just crazy to me. You know, baseball is at a low point right now. Cheating is causing them to really deal with problems. Uh, the majority of people in college or in their 20s uh, don't care about baseball. It seems to me like, first of all, the, un uh, the unwritten rules of baseball are killing the sport. I hate it. I think social media needs to be more prevalent. They really have this lockdown on social media. They don't let people share their videos. They're a pain. Uh, they make people like John Boy. John Boy Media is like the best thing in the world for baseball, and they're not nice to him. They're not better to him. They should really let him monetize his videos. They should let him do more, but they have this lock and key thing that makes his life harder. Um, they take the personality out of baseball with their unwritten rules, like bat flips. I love them. That's what my, <laughs> my favorite moment in baseball. A guy hits a home run, and he stares down the pitcher. He flips his bat to celebrate. That's awesome. And baseball doesn't like those, which is so dumb. Like social media loves them. What, when I watch it, during the NFL season, every Saturday and Sunday, all I see on my phone are guy dancing, doing a he scores a touchdown, what's his dance, how does the team celebrate? You don't get that moment in baseball because they censor it. They don't like it. They literally hate personality. And it seems to me like the only people I know in their early 20s that watch baseball are literally dudes who used to play baseball in high school. And that's not a, that's not a big enough group of people to sustain the, the business that Major League Baseball is. And then even worse is that the majority of baseball's fan base are old people. My grandpa. And my grandpa watches baseball like he doesn't really watch it. He kind of falls asleep to it. It's just sitting on a television. It's on because it's the thing that's on. But whether baseball was on or something else, my grandpa would be in that chair regardless. He's not glued to the television. It's background noise. And that's what baseball is for a lot of old people. What happens when old people die? Because if you don't know, this is a really controversial opinion. It's actually not an opinion. It's fact. Old people die. <laughs> what happens when their fan base, the majority of their fan base, dies and gets so old they're just not around anymore? Their fan base is literally going to die off in Major League Baseball. So um, I don't know, man. Uh, what's going to happen to baseball in the next 10 years? I have no idea. I'm so curious. Um, and football, I, I do wonder. I said I would talk about football. Oh, I'm so curious. Will the Cleveland Browns, will the Cleveland Browns ever make it work? Are they ever going to get, are they ever going to win? I so badly would love to see the Browns win, but they might not ever make it happen. Uh, and then how is the quarterback position going to evolve and change in the next 10 years? Uh, we saw recently like quarterbacks now have to be mobile. It's just, you have to be, if you can't extend a play and move around, you're not going to succeed as a quarterback in the NFL. Not saying you need to run like Lamar Jackson, but if you got concrete feet and you can't move and extend a play and run to the perimeter between, you know, to the sideline at least, you're not going to make it work as an NFL quarterback. I also wonder, are quarterback gurus as head coaches? You know that uh, the last quarterback guru I can really think of is that, what is his name? I'm blanking on it right now. It's the bald guy uh, who coached for the Cleveland Browns. He was the last quarterback guru I can really think who got a job. I think that stigma, that thing, quarterback guru is gone Joey Judge got hired by the Giants. Uh, the, the, you know, uh, Matt Rule. The guys being hired now for NFL head coaches are good leaders of men who delegate and hire offensive coordinators and aren't. They don't focus on one thing. The guru mentality with head coaches appears to be over, which is a good thing in my book because it's better to have a great leader who can delegate to other talented people rather than a guy who's just the best at quarterbacks. Like the best at quarterbacks should coach quarterbacks not an entire football team. So is the quarterback guru era over? That's what I'm excited to watch in the NFL and in football. Um, I'm curious what quarterbacks, what young quarterbacks won't make it. There's a lot of young quarterbacks right now uh, with potential, by the way, Gardner Minshew, uh, Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield, Daniel Jones, Justin Herbert, Tua, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, Sam Darnold, Joe Burrow, and so many more. Jordan Love, Jacob Eason, uh, I mean, I, I, Justin Herbert, I don't know, man. There are so many guys, and they can't all make it. There, there are going to be guys from the list I just named, the, the names I just listed. How do you, English is hard, whatever. But there are guys who are going to fail as quarterbacks, and I wonder who they are. Maybe it's Baker Mayfield. I'd be, I'd be surprised, because Baker's so talented, but I wouldn't be that shocked. 
But there are definitely quarterbacks that are entering the NFL or just already have entered the NFL that aren't going to make it and aren't going to have careers that I think they're potentially could have. They might under, they're going to underachieve. Somebody's going to underachieve. Who will those guys be? And then, you know, look at 2029 right now. We're in 2020. That's nine, you know, 10 years away. Where will NFL teams be? You know, the Raiders are moving to Vegas. Are the Jaguars going to move? Are the Chargers going to move? Are we going to get a team in London? I don't think so, but maybe. But where will teams literally be geographically located in 2029? Those are all the things I'm excited for in the next 10 years in sports. Uh, The best player in basketball. Will baseball be around? How's the quarterback position going to change? Those are the things I'm passionate about and the things I love in the world of sports. And that's what I'm excited for in the next 10 years, looking forward to in the world of sports. Okay, uh, Jaron has a question. He certainly does. Uh, Jaron writes in, he says, what are your thoughts on the idea that the NFL might rig this weekend so that the Chiefs and the Packers play so it can be a rematch to Super Bowl one? I should have changed the verbiage of this question. He asked this, obviously, before championship weekend. Um, although it's actually better to read the question now because clearly the NFL is not rigged, which means it's not um, planned. <laughs> you know, uh, Super Bowl one, yes, was the Packers and the Chiefs. And a lot of people thought, Maybe the NFL is going to pull a fast one and decide to have that rematch of the first Super Bowl. Uh, it's so stupid for anybody. It is so dumb if anybody believes that the NFL is rigged or planned or scripted. It's literally impossible. Uh, the WWE is scripted. It's planned. Now, loosely planned. You can't plan an entire fight. But you can plan the outcome and have little themes throughout the fight you can you can script. And that's, that's how it works. I know somebody. I'm... Not kidding. I know a guy. I got a direct message from him on Instagram. I know a guy who writes for the WWE. (laughs) We had a whole conversation about it, how it works. That's how it works. You can't do that for the NFL. You can't loosely script an NFL game. You have 22 guys on the field at all times. In wrestling, you have two guys. Sometimes you have a cage match and you have four people, you know, four people in a, a ring at once. You can loosely plan what happens for four people. 22 people on a field at once. You can't loosely plan what happens. And you can't plan guys. Watch a game. Watch a football game. Nothing is staged. Nothing is scripted. If you understand anything about football, it's literally impossible to do. Not to mention, here's where it really falls apart. Forget 22 guys and the complications of trying to plan that. The NFL has thousands and thousands and thousands of employees. And they have, in the history of the NFL, had thousands and thousands of employees. If the NFL was scripted, somebody would leak it. Somebody would make it public knowledge. And somebody's like, well, they, they would have, they would sue the guy. No, you can literally leak something. And have, people have leaked stuff to me, believe it or not. There are people out there that say, hey, Zach, we want you to talk about this. And they work in a front office, so they do this or that. And like, hey, just point, you know, look into this briefly. Here, here's some information. And they give me a little bit, a bit of information. Uh, but they don't, how would anybody figure out who my source is? That's a, it's impossible. So my point is this. You couldn't hide the secret. If the NFL was staged or rigged or scripted, you couldn't keep it a secret at all. It's just impossible. There's too many moving parts, too many moving pieces. Uh, the NFL, the narrative that the NFL is rigged and scripted is one I will never, ever revisit ever again. I'm never talking about it ever. But I want to make a topic so people can always go back to it and I can say, you're dumb. You're an idiot. If you believe it's scripted, go live under a rock or go take off your tinfoil hat, relax a little bit, because it's complete, impossible, utter nonsense. Okay. Okay, well, we can move forward with our lives. Um, Aiden writes in. I like Aiden. Uh, Really, uh, we've had cool conversations. Aiden says, hey, Zach, with the talk of NFL expansion into Canada, Mexico, and England, and with a handful of foreign players born in the NFL, handful of foreign-born players in the NFL. Do you think football will ever make it into the Olympics? And would you want it to? All the best, Adam. (sighs) Um, Respectfully, football's never going to make it into American football, played with a pigskin and uprights and and hash marks, is never going to be played in the Olympics. Uh, It's played in America. It's played a little bit in Germany. I know there are other, like Australia plays it. There's like little communities in Iceland that play football, but it's not a, a big thing in other sports. Um, compare soccer and football. Soccer's played in every single country in the entire world. Uh, rugby, 
I was watching All or Nothing with the uh, New Zealand All Blacks. Rugby is played in 118 countries. Football's played in like three, like three literally. Nobody in the world could ever beat America in football. If they put out their best football players, they're still not going to compete and be able to beat America. And th- let me tell you, there's not even enough countries to field a World Cup of football. It's not possible. So um, it's it's gonna it's never going to happen. You're never going to see the American football in the Olympics. It's impossible. Um, it's it's just a reality. It, it's, I mean, it's a cool dream. It would take 100 years for teams to build enough infrastructure. Like I mean, like youth programs and having pads and having footballs and helmets like soccer is ubiquitous and it's simple and easy. Um, Football takes a lot of equipment and to have to retrofit countries to have all the equipment and all the necessary tools and the coaching and the people that know the game well enough to even coach the game to catch up with America because football, let's let's be honest, is a very refined, well-developed sport. I mean, look look at America. America is behind in the world of soccer, (laughs) right? Uh, We don't have, I live in America. We don't have the same coaching infrastructure that other countries that have soccer do. That's why America is behind in the world of soccer because our infrastructure relating to soccer isn't developed enough compared to Britain or the UK or Germany or France or Brazil. I mean, there's just not a culture of soccer the same way there is in other countries. Other countries would have the similar problem. There's not a culture of football there. And so uh, that's a long-winded, way longer than it needed to be answered to say that football is never going to be in the Olympics. It's just not possible. It's never going to be possible. Uh, it would take a hundred years for teams to catch up to the America. And then even then, uh, it's, it's not possible. So football will never be in the Olympics. And it's not about our country versus your country or anybody better. It's none of that. It's just that it's feasibly not possible. Uh, okay. There's a name here. I I don't know how to pronounce it. It's, it's spelled J O S U E. Josu? Jose? Josu? I have no idea how to say your name. Uh, Josu, Josie, jo- jo- Jose. I'm really sorry. I don't know. I, if it was Jose, it'd be Jose. It's Jose with a U in the middle of it. So I don't know how to spell that. And I, I'm totally sorry. I apologize, man. Uh, but I'm really grateful. And I want to read your question. The question is, hello, Zach. What do you think about soccer? Would you ever consider talking about it on the show? Um, yeah, I don't have anything against soccer or talking about soccer. Uh, I love going to soccer games. I went to a game uh, a long time ago in Texas. I went to a game in LA one time. Um, it's fun to get drunk and yell at the yell at a field of people playing soccer. Like that's getting drunk and yelling and the singing and the chanting is so much fun. I've actually never been to a Portland Timbers game. I live near Portland. Um, I want to do that actually at some point. I'm really excited. I'll get drunk and I'll bring my friends and we'll, we'll have a rowdy old time. Um, but I, I do also want to acknowledge, I know nothing about soccer, nothing. I mean, I, I know less about soccer than most fans of soccer. know. I don't know anything about it at all. And so, um, and honestly, I mean, this is brutal, but this is true. I don't care about soccer storylines. I mean, it would be incredibly disingenuous of me to talk about the Premier League and free agency in the Premier League or trades. I don't know it, don't care about it, never paid attention to it in my entire life. Um, like, and, and baseball, the NBA, the NFL, that takes up all my time to try to learn how to follow the Premier League and follow soccer or follow uh, La Liga. Like, I, no way, it's just not going to happen. Um, I think I'm gonna do a little bit of hockey because that's fun and I do have a general interest in that. Um, but I can't pretend to care about something I don't care about. That's wrong. I will say I love the World Cup. I enjoy the World Cup a lot. Uh, I've watched the World Cup with my friends every time it's been on the last couple of years and it's cool. Um, but I don't understand the strategy of soccer at all. And if somebody out there, I'm, I'm not kidding, uh, my friend Andrew Morgan uh, loves soccer. Maybe him and I could sit down and he could teach me the, the game of soccer. And if anyone out there wants to ever have a beer with me and talk about soccer... Um, I'm all in. I, I'm, I'm all ears. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to learn about soccer. That sounds fun. Uh, the technical aspect, because I don't understand the game at all. Really, I truly don't. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm down to talk about the World Cup when it's on, because that's, it's a, it's a shared experience. Well, we all have. But when I talk about soccer, I talk about it as a fan, not as an analyst, not as an expert. I'm not an expert at all. Um, I at least played high school basketball. I at least played high school baseball. I played uh, played football in college. I, I know the game of football. I think I know quarterbacks better than a lot of people even in the NFL. I really think I'm a better quarterback analyst than half the people uh, in NFL front offices. I get questions from NFL front offices. I'm not even kidding about the quarterback position. So uh, that's where I'm an expert. I know my lane. I know what I'm good at. And me talking about soccer or trying to pretend I'm something I'm not would be wrong. It'd be bad content. It'd be totally disingenuous. And uh, I'm not going to go there. 
Um, but again, during the World Cup, if I see something I want to talk about, I'm not going to, I'm going to talk about it. I'm not going to not make a video about something I care about. Um, but it has to be genuine and honest and I have to learn about the game. So um, that's how I feel about soccer. But again, uh, as a fan, soccer's fun, man. Going to a game, going to a soccer game, uh, getting drunk, yelling, chanting, singing the songs, awesome. And a, a kind of a bucket list thing for me would be to go to a World Cup and maybe meet some strong opinion sports fans and have a grand old time drinking a, a brew and yelling at the yelling at a field of guys running around. But that's my extent of soccer, and that's what I know about the world of soccer. Uh, Travel writes in. Travel says, "Hey Zach, I've been noticing for a while now." that you've been drinking water. What happened to your special drink? And if you don't mind me asking, could you tell us what it was? Travel, thank you for the question. Uh, special drink is right here. I actually have it every single show. I don't, I haven't been doing a good enough job to say like, hey, I'm drinking my special drink. I probably should do a better job acknowledging that. Um, it's still my favorite drink. Like when I go out to, to I don't go to parties. I, I, I pretend, I, I talk about going to parties. I don't, I just don't at all. I don't care about that. Um, but uh, when, I, when I do, <laughs> What did I do? I went to Thanksgiving. I, I took this drink with me to Thanksgiving, actually, because I didn't really want to drink alcohol. I had to drive home. Um, I'm talking with the company that makes this drink behind the scenes. And someday you'll know what it is. Um, last time I talked to that company, they said, hey, uh, get back to us in 2020. Since then, I've hired my dad as my manager to take care of that stuff. And so he's talking to them. And it just, you know, building sponsorship relationships takes a long time. And there's a lot of st stuff behind the scenes that has to happen. But um, it takes forever and it, it is taking forever, but this is absolutely my favorite drink. Someday they're going to be a sponsor of strong opinion sports. That's my goal. That's my mission. And, um, cause I want to tell you guys what it is, but until I get them as a sponsor, I'm not going to say what it is. I'm going to keep it a secret, hold it close to my chest. Um, but Travel, someday, the day that you know what I'm drinking is a day you and I can celebrate because that'll be a really cool moment for the show. It means we got the drink sponsor I've wanted for six months. And so I'm going to, I'm going to keep that to myself and not tell you what it is but someday we'll celebrate together on the show when I say the drink is blank and you'll be like oh that's cool I never expected that so um yeah I'm gonna keep it keep it a secret but do know that someday that is coming I'm gonna drink some of it because my my eyeballs are like <clears throat> you know when you have something in your throat and it makes your eyes water I'm there Ooh, what's happening oh, I'm having a moment I should break. I'm not going to because we only have one, two. Okay, we have a lot of questions left. I'm going to recover. I got this. I don't need to take a break. We're 52 minutes in. What the heck? This show blows my... I guess really it's like 15 minutes because I start... I hit the timer, then it takes a while. I walk around the room and you know set up stuff, and then I, then I end up talking into the mic about two minutes after I set up everything up. But, um, wow, we're ways in. Seb writes in. <clears throat> Seb says, hey, Zach. Here's a non-football related question for you. If you could choose any five people to make up your dream dinner table, past or present, who would you choose and why? Love the show and thanks for looking at this with your eyeballs from Seb in the UK. Seb, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I wouldn't have dinner with five people. I, I just wouldn't. What I would do is have, I, it's not true. I wouldn't have five people with me at a dinner table. That sounds like hell. That sounds awful. What I would do is have five dinners one-on-one -on -one with the people I want to hang out with. Uh, and however, here's a caveat. If I could have dinner with any five people in the world, here's what I would do. Uh, my brother died in 2016. I'd have dinner with Zane, my younger brother, who I miss tremendously. Uh, anybody past or present, it's him. I'd have dinner with my family, like I grew up with. And uh, that'd be amazing and interesting and wild. And we'd share stories and I'd tell him about the show. <laughs> and I'd tell him about Strong in Sports. And it makes me want to cry because I, uh, I, I wish so badly I could tell my brother about what this is, man, the, the coolest part of my life is something he never is going to get to experience. My, my job is everything to me, and Strong Opinion Sports is the most meaningful thing I've ever done in, in my lifetime. And my, my brother Zane will, mm, <laughs> will never know what that is. And that's pretty uh, painful and, and, and rough. And so uh, if I could have dinner with anybody in the world, past or present, automatically it's Zane. Now, um, whew, let's say, let's say, I'm going to take, I'm going to fun with this question, though, because. I do have four other people I want to talk about that if, if, I, if it wasn't Zane, there's other people I'd love to meet with. And I feel kind of guilty because there's no like world leaders here. There's not like, you know, I, maybe I should have put like Martin Luther King. I'd be really interesting to hear his perspectives, but I don't have anybody like that. For me, it was people that have been influential in my life that I'd love to talk to. Uh, and then one guy that just fascinates me. 
um, the four people beside my younger brother Zane who died that I'd love to have dinner with, and again, it'd be one-on-one because I want to have one-on-one conversations, is John Bellion. Uh, he's my favorite artist. Tom Brady, Gardner Minshew, and then uh, Shahid Khan, who is the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Shad Khan. He's, uh, he was born in Pakistan. He became a billionaire. He literally made himself a billionaire. A lot of guys are, a lot of people that are billionaires in the world, or a lot of people that are multimillionaires are people who came from money. He did not. He, he, at one point, I was reading a story. He made like a dollar twenty an hour at one point, one of his jobs in America. Like he really, he made himself what he is, and he's a billionaire. And I would love, more than anything, to hang out with Shahid Khan and hear his stories and hear about his life because he is the most underrated, fascinating owner in sports. I mean, I, I don't know how, like nobody seems to recognize Shahid Khan is incredible. We don't talk about him. We talk about Jerry Jones. We talk about people who, who's a fine dude, but Shahid Khan is like the most underrated owner in the NFL. Nobody talks about him. If I could have a beer with anybody in the NFL related to the NFL, it's Tom Brady or Shahid Khan. I mean, he's so cool and nobody understands. I should make a whole video dedicated to why Shahid Khan is like the coolest dude in the world. I really should. I'm, as I'm talking about this, I'm realizing I got to make a video about Shahid Khan and explain to people why the Jaguars owner it's such a fascinating, really cool dude. Um, again, it'd be five dinners, one-on-one. I want to talk to you guys one-on-one. I- I'd meet with Tom Brady. Tom Brady has been a uh, one of the most inspirational people in my entire life because his story, Tom Brady, if you don't understand, Tom Brady's, I, I mean, I guess he's good-looking, but he's not physically gifted, right? He doesn't have a giant arm. He's not fast. The reason why Tom Brady's so great is because he's prepared and he works harder than you and you and everybody else in the NFL. He literally has dedicated his life to playing quarterback. And I'd love to meet with him and you know, have some of his wisdom rub off on me. It'd be just interesting to me. Gardner Minshew is the most interesting man in the world. Uh, I saw Gardner Minshew is so cool. Gardner Minshew put a picture on Instagram. I saw it this morning where he had his very first mustache he ever shaved in a plastic bag. And he said, I'm selling this for a million dollars. Is it real? Is it fake? Is it a joke? Is it not? Who knows? And that's why Gardner Minshew is so cool, right? He's a dude. He's like, he wears aviators. He gets in jet planes. He's the coolest dude in the world, in my opinion. Like, just cool. I mean, like, in the old school cool. Like, this dude is amazing. So self-aware. So secure. Um, like, I have, like, kind of a man. Like, not a, a man crush isn't the right word. But, like, dude, he's just the coolest. Gardner Minshew. I would kill to do an interview with him. If you're out there, Gardner, if you're out, literally, Gardner Minshew, if you're watching this video by any chance, um, I'd love to meet you. In fact, uh, there was a guy in NFL Europe one time, I guess in, uh, he was in Europe, it was when the Jaguars played in London, and Gardner Minshew was signing autographs, and he was actually talking to him, he said, hey, do you know Zach Schaumler? And Gardner Minshew goes, that's the guy who made the video about me, right? I'm like, what? Gardner Minshew watched my video, or, or at least knows my video exists? What the heck? That To meet Gardner Minshew and like shake his hand and hear his life story a little bit would be incredible. Um, and then John Bellion. John Bellion is my favorite musical artist. And he doesn't give very many interviews. He's an incredibly cool dude. Uh, his lyrics have so much depth. And um, if I could just shake John Bellion's hand and tell him thank you for his music. And look, even if I met him for five minutes and just said, had a human moment with him and I said, man, uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I just want to tell you thank you. Because John, John Bellion's music has gotten me through the hardest moments of my entire life. I mean, his, his music, it's incredible. Uh, listen to um, Money Right, M-U-N-N-Y, Money, but with a U, Money Right by John Bellion. is an incredibly beautiful song all about uh, the struggle of trying to be, trying to make it as an artist, right? And, and the failure and how he talks about in eighth grade, he was depressed and at 19, he was depressed. He dropped out of college, which I dropped out of college at 19. Like, I get it. Like, his, his journey to me just resonated so much with me. And I, um, the song is literally my life. I mean, when I was 22, I was depressed. When I was 19, I dropped out of college. When I was 22, I finally made it as a, as a content creator. And John Belling's the same way. He made it when he was 22. The song is him going, you know, eighth grade, I feel depressed is blank. Fast forward, now I'm 22. And with perspective, looking back, the journey makes sense. So John Bellion, I'm just going on a rant, is my favorite musical artist in the world. Um, and, you know, Preoccupied is a really cool song all about how he just want, needs to focus on enjoying his life. And then all the things he wants and desires are going to work themselves out if he just r- learns to enjoy it uh, and make great art. And so um, I, if I could, if anyone, if I could, <laughs> I don't want to say this without sounding stupid. Uh, like people say, who, who do you look up to in the sports world? Uh I don't know. I don't. I really don't look up to anybody in this. I try to do my own thing, but if I do look up to anybody in the creative field at all, it's John Bellion. 
I'd love to be the John Belling of, of the sports world where I have this you know, my own unique thing that uh, is just different a little bit and I do it, do it my way and that's cool. Um, and I don't follow the rules that you're supposed to in my industry. I just have fun with it. And so um, John Belling, again, again the, the five people I'd love to have dinner with if I could, it'd be my brother Zane because that self-explanatory, man. My brother Zane's dead and I would give anything to, to see him again. Uh, and then Shahid Khan, the owner of the Jaguars, is an incredibly cool dude. Gardner Minshew was the coolest. Like, how crazy is it, by the way, that the coolest quarterback in the NFL is the coolest owner in the NFL? Like, they they got I hope they have dinner together someday and just they, they just talk because I I'd love to film dinner with Shahid Khan and Gardner Minshew. Like, what is that like? That's incredible. Tom Brady's a guy I'd love to have dinner with, and then uh, John Bellion is a guy that I would even if he gave me ten minutes of his time and I could shake his hand and tell him thank you. Um, I, I, I wouldn't be starstruck. I don't think, I think I'd just be nice because that's how I feel. I don't, I'm a creator too. Like when I meet people, I've met people, I've met Kirk Herbstreet. I've met a lot of people. Uh, I, I met, uh, what's the guy, the, the coaches from, uh, from college game day. I did college game day. I met, uh, Tom Rinaldi. I met, uh, what's the guy from Howard something, the guy from Michigan, uh, the, who had the return. He's a, a return man. Point is this. I've met a lot of people in, in the world that are kind of bigger names than you'd think. And, you know, my time in L.A. and my time here. And uh, I've never really gotten starstruck because I understand that they're just people who have a job. And so I guess maybe the reason I say all that is because if John Billion ever sees this, John, I'm out here. I'd love to buy you dinner. I'd love to talk to you privately, man. I, um, he's my favorite artist in the world. And if you, if you don't say it, it never happens. So all I can say is put that out to the world. Maybe John Billion, someone's listening and get me in touch with him because he's just the best. And uh I'd love to just have a, a real human conversation with him, talk about life, and uh, it'd be a, an amazing thing. Guys, um, I want to shift gears now to uh, Tristan. Tristan writes in. He says, hey, Zach, my question of the day is, what is your favorite genre of music? Love the vids. Uh, I don't have a favorite genre of music. It's really like, well, it's John Bellion music is my favorite. I mean, I, I 95% of all the music I listen to is John Bellion, literally. Um, but I do, if it's not John Bellion, what I really do listen to is like sad, melancholy, acoustic guitar music. I, I love like um, Alec Benjamin's awesome. He tells great stories. I love Phineas, uh, who's Billie Eilish's older brother, who is, he's, his, he's our producer, but he makes really cool music where it's like, he just tells you a story. Um, my three favorite artists are Quinn 92, AJR, and John Bellion. I, to me, lyrics are so important, and uh, I love when it. A, a, a band or an artist can tell you really good lyrics. Like AJR's song, uh, Come Hang Out, perfectly describes how I felt in college when people were like, come hang out. You you know, you, all you do is work. And I was like, well, all I want to do is work. I want to build Strong Opinion Sports. And so it's Friday night. Like ton tonight's Friday night, by the way. It's Friday night. I'm recording Strong Opinion Sports. And that's what I want to do with my Friday night because I have a goal and I have a dream and I have a vision. And I want to make this into what I believe in. And I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything because I'm doing what I love. And would I rather record the show or have a drink with people in a bar somewhere, easily I'd rather record the show. It's my favorite thing in the world. And I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. And people regularly don't understand that about me. And so Come Hang Out's amazing. Uh, Normal's a great song by AJR. Uh, I'm a good pretender. It's really good. Pretenders is good. Um, Money Right, M-U-N-N-Y, Money Right is my favorite song by John Bellion. It's all about chasing your dreams and the heartache of how hard it is. I talked about it earlier in the show in a different topic. Um, Man, those are the, the songs I like. To me, what makes music great is there's two things. It's feel. Does the song feel good? Um, Rune 5 nails this. They got a lot of songs that are like, it just make you like want to move. I'm at a pay phone. Like, as cheesy as it is, and it, it's, it's, there's a reason for that. It makes you feel good. Like, Guillotine by John Bellion makes you want to move. Dun, bum, ba, da, bum, bum, ba, da. Like, so music is about feel, but it's also to me about lyrics. And if you don't have both, I don't want to listen to it. I want a song that makes you feel something. You know, whether the emotion is good or bad, but it's the way, it's not lyrics, it's the vibe of the song, and then it's the lyrics. Do the lyrics have a story? Are they impactful? Do they matter? So when a song has both of those, that's what I love and I care about. And music, and I didn't really answer my favorite genre, because I don't have one. I'm open to music. I, I like a lot of music, although my favorite is probably like, however you would classify John Bellion, which is like, they call it melting pop, which is... That John Bellion, you know, he plays whatever he wants, which means John Bellion plays piano acoustically. He sings. He can rap. Um, he doesn't let a genre define him or limit him. That's that's what I like is when an artist just makes what they believe in. That's what I love. Uh, Melting Pop is what John Bellion, it's what Quinn 92 called John Bellion one time in an interview. And I was like, ah, that's pretty good. Uh, if you don't ever, if you love music like I do, I, I love music, man. It's, it's my one of my passions, uh, especially increasingly so. 
Uh, listen to the Zach Sang show. I know I shouldn't really promote other podcasts, but why, who cares? The Zach Sang show. Uh, I'd love to interview Zach Sang. I want to know how he started because he he clearly built an audience, and then he he gets incredibly talented musicians on his show. But I think he's because he's cultivated relationships with people and worked really hard behind the scenes. Zach Sang has because like, how do you become Zach Sang? How do you get you know permission to interview incredibly rich, wealthy? incredible artist. I mean, he must have started like in New York or LA or something and interviewed like really tiny bands. And then some of those really tiny bands got really famous and then told their friends about Zach Sang. Like it must be how it works. I don't understand. But uh, the Zach Sang show is an incredible show about music and about artists and their stories. And uh, it made me love Alec Benjamin a lot more. He's coming to Portland. I'm going to go see him. So if you're out there and you want to run into me in public, go watch, go listen to Alec Benjamin in Portland whenever he comes. Um, but uh, Tristan, I didn't directly answer your question, but I, I, I kind of did. I talked about music a lot, and, and maybe that's what you wanted to hear. So uh, my favorite artist, uh, Quinn92, John Bellion, AJR. That's all I have to say about music and my, uh, my passion and love uh, for music. Patrick writes in. He says, hey, Zach, after you talked about your favorite movies of all time, I wondered what your favorite TV shows are. Mine are BoJack Horseman because it has great jokes, but is amazingly real and tackles mental health issues very well. Interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't really read your... I read the, the show part, but didn't read the rest of the question. But Jack Horseman, huh? I should look into it. Uh, he also says, I love Mr. Robot because it is incredibly well-written, shot, and acted. I like the main actor in Mr. Robot. Um, I recommend you watch these if you haven't seen them. But anyways, which shows do you like? Greetings, Patrick. Uh, my favorite show of all time. It's <sighs> unparalleled. You're going to laugh at me. It's Survivor on CBS. I love Survivor with a... With everything I have, it's like if you don't know Survivor, what it is is thirty you know, is uh, a bunch of people get put on an island for thirty nine days, and every two days or so, you you vote someone off the island until you have three people left, and then uh, ten of the people you voted out, or, or it's it's nine, go on the jury, and you have to explain to them why they should vote for you now to win. I, I didn't explain it well at all. If you don't know Survivor, you don't know Survivor. That's a, that's a you problem. Uh, Survivor's incredible, man. Uh, I'm a nerd, like. I'm a gigantic, massive Survivor nerd. Like, I, m- more than you would think. I understand. Like, I love the way the show is edited and the produced, and I can tell, I can predict what's going to happen in an episode based on the editing of the first 10 minutes, roughly, which is like, I, I have a skill now because I watch so much Survivor. I've watched every season multiple times. I'm a nerd. My, my girlfriend makes fun of me. Um, that's a new thing in my life. I haven't told anybody about that, but I, like I said, I do have a girlfriend. Um, and I, like one of my dreams in life would be to go on Survivor. I don't know how that would work because I'm a public figure to some degree and I would have to explain why I'm leaving for 39 days. Maybe that's all. Maybe I'd be like, hey, CBS, I won't tell them what I'm doing, but can I at least tell my audience I'm leaving for 39 days and I could kind of hint in a nod and it'd let me go. I don't know. Um, but yeah, Survivor's my favorite show of all time. There are a couple other shows I love. Uh, I love Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's the best comedy show in my opinion. It's that or Seinfeld. Uh, they're the best. And to me, though, it's Larry David is the guy who wrote Seinfeld. He's also the guy who writes Curb, and he's the main character of Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's on HBO. And the situations that Larry David, the, the main character and the guy, the, he, he's both, he plays himself in the show. And it's so cool because he, in the show, he finds himself in these just complicated social situations. And the way he deals with it reminds me so much of me. Like, he's a curmudgeon. He hates people, but he's got to talk to people and work with people and Oh my gosh, it's the best. He's just, um, why if you haven't ever seen Curb Your Enthusiasm, it's not for everybody because it's, uh, some people hate it. They, they just think it's boring. They don't get it. If you don't get it, you don't get it. No problem. But if you ever get the chance, give Curb Your Enthusiasm a try. It's phenomenal. Um, I love Game of Thrones. I, I know that Game of Thrones is, uh, it's not cool to love Game of Thrones because of the way it ended. I thought the ending was fine. I really never, un- I've never understood why everyone hated the ending of Game of Thrones. Like, People are like, it had a sad ending, right? An unsatisfying ending. Ending. I'm like, it's Game of Thrones. When did Game of Thrones ever have a good ending? Or have, like, six years and was it eight or nine? How many ever? However many seasons of Game of Thrones, right? The show was known for being unsatisfying. It was known for having characters you love die and having sad moments. And that's why I love Game of Thrones because it was real and it was honest. And of course, the show ended in an unsatisfying, sad way. That's how the show was. The show never lied about what it was. It never hid what it was. And for whatever reason, the show, it's it's like, what if I made Strong Opinion Sports every single day? And then one day people were like, we want you to talk about bocce ball why aren't you talking about bocce ball and i was like the show's never been about bocce ball why would you expect that i know that's 
a passionate rant a little bit out of left field, but I, I don't understand the hatred of Game of Thrones. It's like the people just suddenly forgot what the show was and then hate it. Um, every time I rewatch Game of Thrones, like you get more out of it. It's like an onion. I, I went back and watched the first episode uh, like two months ago and I got even more out of it than I did the first time because you notice other things and the, they do such a good job. It's such a well story that's well woven together that every little thing hints to the future, even things that like, there are things in season one that you never really understand until season five. That's amazing. That's incredible. They were able to make that happen. And so Game of Thrones is, is one of the better shows of all time. And it doesn't get the respect it deserves because people hated the way it ended, which is so stupid. How do you end a show like that? I don't know. Um, I love Stargate SG-1. It's a nerdy sci-fi show that's just, uh, it's got my heart. If you don't know, uh, Stargate came out, was it the 80s or the 90s, the 70s? I think in the 90s, I believe Stargate SG, Stargate, the movie came out with Kurt Russell and James Spader. And it's awesome. Like, it's this cool, pulpy, sci-fi action movie. Um, and then what they did was they took that idea of Stargate and made Stargate SG-1 and continued the story with the exact same characters from the movie. Now, they didn't have James Spader or Kurt Russell. They replaced him. But they did a great job with incredible casting to replace the two of them. Uh, Michael Shanks, I forget the guy's name. Captain O'Neill, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, I forget Captain O'Neill's name. He did incredible, though, the guy who replaced him. Uh, he's the guy who is MacGyver, actually. I'm so I'm blanking on his name right now, but they I got MacGyver to play Captain O'Neill in Stargate SG-1. An incredible show. I love space. I love exploring things, and it's uh, I'm a nerd about space, and that's what the show's about. To some degree, it's really not about, it's about people, and every episode, they go to a different location, and so you get a different... It feels like an anthology series. So like what I love about anthology series, what that means is that uh, like Black Mirror is an anthology series where every episode is a slightly different story. But what I love about Stargate SG-1 is it gets that feel. Like every episode they go through a different gate to a different area. So you get a different setting every time with different storylines, but you follow the same cast of characters. And the people in Stargate SG-1 are basically superheroes. Captain O'Neill, uh, Sam... You have uh, Michael Shanks' character, the Doctor. You have uh, Teal'c. They're like superhero characters that go on adventures together. And it's like, God dang it, man. It's so much fun. I love, love Stargate. It's on Amazon if you ever want to watch it. Watch the movie first. Watch the Stargate movie. Then watch the TV show, and it's just phenomenal. Um, the TV show Jericho is really great. Jericho's on Netflix. It ended unceremoniously. It ended early. They did give like a an hour and a half episode to kind of end the show and wrap it up a little bit better than they could have uh so it does get a it got canceled but they got kind of an ending to it which is cool but and it's this is a show where jericho is about the united states getting nuked the, sh the world is like destroyed however it's not a post-apocalyptic show it's not like walking dead it's not like the it's not like uh the road i mean there's still society there's still power they have generators they're learning it's, it's really they have an infrastructure there and it's a little town trying to cope with what happened in the world. And it's really cool. Um, great show on Netflix. And then there's another show on Amazon Prime. It's the last show I'll talk about. It's called Modern Love. Uh, I watched it with my, uh, my girlfriend the, uh, last night, actually. We were three episodes in. And uh, it's an anthology series, meaning that every episode is, about, is a different story with actually completely different actors, too. So it's like, it's completely different every single episode. Um, and it's... It's moving, man. It's so well written. It's an incredible show. The, the first episode is it's about a doorman who cares about a girl and his his fatherly love, basically, for this character. And you're like, oh, I, I already like go watch it. Go watch Modern Love. Modern Love on Amazon Prime. It's phenomenal. It literally, I'm not kidding, made me cry in each one of the first three episodes. It's just phenomenal. The third episode is Anne Hathaway, and it starts weird. You're like, what is this? I hate this, and I hated it, but that you're supposed to hate it. It's supposed to feel off and weird, and. Uh, it's just incredible, man. It's so good. So the, the six shows I mentioned, I, Survivor, favorite show of all time, not even close. I love uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's great. It's a comedy. Uh, Game of Thrones is great. If you're, a, I don't know how you haven't watched Game of Thrones, but it is phenomenal if you ever get to watch it. And don't listen to people who say the ending is terrible. It's, it's worth it. It's, it's just a great show. I recommend it. Um, Stargate SG-1. If you love sci-fi and you want a fun superhero, it, it feels like they don't have superpowers or anything, but... They, you get to love the characters, man. The characters are awesome. Their relationships with each other. Stargate SG-1 is phenomenal. Uh, and then it actually does tie into Stargate Atlantis. So if you ever want to, you can watch both the series together. If you're a huge fan like I am and a huge nerd, it's great. Uh, Jericho is incredible. It's on Netflix. And then watch 
Modern Love. It's on Amazon Prime. It's an Amazon original. Modern Love is great. Uh, Survivor, Curb Enthusiasm, Game of Thrones, Stargate, SG-1, Jericho, and Modern Love. Those are my favorite television shows of all time. Let's move on to the last question of the day. Henry writes in. Henry says, do you think that the window for the Chiefs to win a championship will close after this season if they don't get it now? While Mahomes is obviously great, I fear that his weight on the salary cap in the next seasons will result in a lot of playmakers currently on the offense departing from the team. To be clear, I definitely think he deserves the money, and I wouldn't advocate necessarily for him to take a hometown discount. However, I just worry that this speedster identity isn't sustainable without one. Speedster, I think, is the identity of the Chiefs football team. They're speed, they're quick, and yada yada. Um, Henry. Patrick Mahomes is so great, I don't think it matters. Like, I, he is... I truly believe that anytime you have Patrick Mahomes on your football team, you have an opportunity to win a Super Bowl. He's he's that good. And I'm not being hyperbolic. Uh, I, I think he's actually probably the best quarterback of all time. I mean, just, and, and that's, I know how big of a statement that is, but people don't realize how much he can take over a game. I actually don't, I don't think I talk about him enough. I, I really don't. I think I'm guilty of not making it clear how great he is. And maybe in like July or June, I'll do a film analysis of Patrick Mahomes to help people understand like, what he does and how amazing it is. Um, but he's a cheat code. I mean, like, actually, for real, Patrick Mahomes is not, is, is almost not fair, like, how good he is and how, how, how much he can beat you. Like, no matter what a defense does, they're wrong. He's gone on a tear of the NFL, and nobody has any idea how to stop him. That's why the Super Bowl is going to be so cool, because maybe finally the 49ers have an answer that can beat Patrick Mahomes. You don't beat Patrick Mahomes, you only slow him down. And so... Um, I think if you're an NFL general manager with Patrick, if you're the Chiefs general manager, all you're trying to do is put a competent team around Patrick Mahomes, and then let Patrick Mahomes do what he's good at, and he's he really is good enough. Uh, I know people say like Aaron Rodgers can carry a team. He can't. Uh, a lot of a lot of quarterbacks can't really carry a team. Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback I, I really think of all time. From a he just is. I mean, I've never seen a quarterback better than Patrick Mahomes. It's it's unbelievable to me. Um. It's kind of insane how much, like, we, the media especially, kind of, like, on my phone, when I go on my phone, I feel like all I see is Patrick Mahomes, and so sometimes that does deter me from talking about him, because the people who are obviously amazing are less interesting to me, like, um, Kirk Cousins is so fascinating, because he's not clearly great, there's, like, a story there, is he, is he not, I, I like, that's, the discussion is fun for me, like, is he good, is he not, trying to understand that. But Patrick Mahomes isn't as exciting to me because it's like, uh, he's amazing, like obviously. And, and then when I get a, a, I get from my phone especially, I get like an attack of Patrick Mahomes all the time because everybody is always talking about how amazing he is. And I think that a little bit has deterred me from talking about him. But I, I got to say, like he actually for real literally is the best quarterback of all time. Like he literally is, there's nobody who's had a better two-year stretch who's been more dominating and better against defenses. And I don't think there's an answer to beat him. As long as he's healthy and can run around a, like enough to buy time, you can't beat Patrick Mahomes. And so, um, I just don't think he. I, I don't think I've given him enough oxygen. I don't think anybody. I don't think you can talk about him enough because he's literally. I mean, I, I'm going to repeat some stuff I said in my last couple podcasts. Patrick Mahomes, you can run the right defense, and you can cover everybody perfectly, and you can be right. I mean, the defense can make the right call, can play great coverage. And he can still beat you. Either he'll extend a play and throw the ball downfield, or he'll extend a play, make someone miss, and run. And he's not even he's not even known as a running quarterback, but against the Tennessee Titans in the AFC Championship game, he had a 27-yard run for a touchdown, and you're like, where does this come from? Or you can have everybody perfectly covered, and he'll make an incredible throw that nobody else in the world, in the world, can make. You can't beat Patrick Mahomes. You can only slow him down. And so, um, arm strength, preparation, he always knows his matchup. You... Most guys who are as good as Patrick Mahomes, who are this gifted, you they always have a problem. Like when I was growing up as a quarterback, there were always guys who were like six foot seven, had rocket arms, were gigantic, and I was better than all of them because I worked harder. They kind of just showed up and knew they were the, the 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 best, and they didn't need to do the work. They didn't need to have better footwork. They didn't need to have uh, great accuracy. They didn't need to have a great understanding of cover two and defenses because they could get away with it. I wasn't talented enough to get away with it. 
So I had to do the work to do other stuff. And it's rare to find a quarterback who's incredibly physically gifted who also does the work because their whole lives they've been able to get away with not needing to do the work. Patrick Mahomes is that rare. Even Brett Favre, God bless Brett Favre. Brett Favre, incredible arm. His knock was he didn't do enough work, I don't think, on the side to be prepared. I mean, he kind of, he, we caught the tail end of Brett Favre's career uh, as the NFL just changed right at the end of Brett Favre's career, but Brett Favre would not be the same quarterback if he played today because he wouldn't work hard enough. He wouldn't be prepared enough. He'd have to do either he'd have to change his approach or he wouldn't make it. He'd be just a guy with an incredible arm. He'd be Deshaun Kaiser who had a great arm and didn't make it. You know, Deshaun Kaiser, the quarterback out of Notre Dame a couple years ago, would have been incredible if he played in the 70s and could have just chucked it deep and thrown the ball 15 times a game, but that's not how the world works anymore. So my, my point is to praise Patrick Mahomes. Like, it's rare to find a guy as talented as him and as physically dominating as him who also does the work and understands defenses and is incredibly prepared. Um, he's an anomaly. He's the greatest quarterback I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I, 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 don't take that, I don't say that hyperbolically. A lot of people in the sports world say these grand statements and they're just talking. I'm not just talking. I, I don't know how I would stop Patrick Mahomes because he's just amazing. And you, um, I, he just deserves a lot of credit. So long rant is over. Is the Super Bowl window going to close for the, the, the Chiefs that they give Patrick Mahomes a gigantic contract? I don't think so. I think their team won't be as physically gifted, right? They're not going to have as many weapons. Maybe they won't have as good a pass rushers or they won't have as good a receivers, but they're still going to have Patrick Mahomes. And anytime you have Patrick Mahomes on your roster, you have an opportunity to win a lot of football games and potentially to win a Super Bowl. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Before I end the show, I do want to say this. Uh, if you're struggling, please go get help. Four years ago, uh, February 8th, 2016, my younger brother died. Took his life, committed suicide, and uh, it was the worst thing I've ever been through. Uh, now, the suicide hotline is 1-800-273-8255. The suicide hotline is 1-800-273-8255. I tell you that because if you talk about suicide, it's you're obligated to mention the suicide hotline. Now, the suicide hotline uh, is not perfect. Uh, it, it does... Uh, I hope you talk to people in your life or you talk to a therapist or you go get professional help. Talk to somebody though. The reason the suicide hotline is important is because if you have nobody else to talk to, you can call them. But if you can talk to somebody in your life, my brother took his life. Uh, he, he killed himself. And I, uh, he never told anybody how much of a hard time he was having. I went home one day, found him dead on the floor in his bedroom. That's awful. I mean, that's, I don't want that for anybody. And I don't want you to die if you're listening out there and you're having a hard time. So I encourage you, if you're struggling, don't suffer in silence. Uh, go talk to people. Go get help. If you need to call the suicide hotline, do it. If not, go get help from somebody. Don't do what my brother did and not talk to anybody. Now, more importantly than that, I, that that's not true. It's not more important. But another lesson I learned when my brother died is that may, you got to make it clear to the people in your life you love them. Uh, I, this is, I, I'm not suicidal, but I didn't do a good enough job telling my brother, I love you. I care about you. If you're having a hard time, you can come talk to me. My brother and I hung out constantly, like all the time. We were, we worked together. We played Halo together. And my brother never once told me how much of a hard time he was having. We never had that conversation. We had very shallow conversations about girls and movies and sports and video games. But we never had that conversation we needed to have. And so I encourage you, don't be afraid to have conversations with depth. Uh, in America, especially like masculinity, it's like, I'm tough and I don't cry. And I had to learn how to cry. When my brother died, I literally had to accept the, the fact that crying is, is valuable and necessary. Uh, it's okay to cry. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to have emotions. Uh, and so don't be afraid. Don't be so macho that you can't have a conversation with somebody. If you're having a hard time or uh, if you care, like, Maybe you're not having a hard time, or maybe your friends aren't having a hard time, but still, tell your friends you love them, you care about them. Uh, I send my friend Elijah a text every couple days. He's in the Air Force. He's the coolest dude, one of the best dudes I've ever met. I'd love to hire him someday to help me edit the show. Uh, Elijah's the best. And I send Elijah a text every couple days saying, hey, man, I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm rooting for you. Hope you're doing well. Just so he knows that I care about him. I really want Elijah to know he means a lot to me. And so I encourage you, tell your friends how much they mean to you. Don't hold back. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Tell the people in your life that you care about how much you care about them and how much they mean to you. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much. I can't say this enough, guys. I love my job. I'm incredibly thankful and gra grateful to do it.
Um, and the next time you see me, we'll be doing a True Lock film analysis. It's almost done. I'm editing it right now. Uh, I've changed the process of how things work. Uh, every, every time I make a film analysis video, I kind of shift it and tweak it just a little bit to make it a little bit better, a little more efficient, make it better for next time. Uh, I'm so excited for you guys to listen to that and to hear that, to see that. Um, guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much for tuning in to Strong Opinion Sports. With the bottom of my heart, you guys are why the show works. Uh, you guys are why uh, I get to watch football and get paid to do it, which is just the best. Uh, it's a dream come true, and I, and I can't say how much I'm grateful for you guys. So, guys, thank you so much. Have a great day. I love you, especially you people on Patreon. You know who you are. You mean the world to me. And uh, ba-dum-bum, bam, we are.